So we are again joined by Prabir. Uh, Prabir, uh, recently uh, Amit Shah has given a comment that this victory will give new direction to the government. So my question is based on that, I mean, what direction is Amit Shah referring to? Because if we look at the BJP government, it has been ferociously following the RSS agenda. So a majority in Rajya Sabha, which way is the government moving towards? Well, I think the first issue really is, this means that you are going to see a majority after the next round of Rajya Sabha elections. So for the first time, after the 2014 elections, BJP is going to control both the houses, which today till date they did not. Once they control the Rajya Sabha, that means that they have the ability to change laws. So we'll have to see what are the laws that they start to change. The checks and balance that the Rajya Sabha provided till now will be gone. We can try and see whether, for instance, we get uh, constitution, we are, legal provisions are introduced for cow protection, forbidding, uh, by, for, for instance, export of meat, mm -hmm. all these kind of issues which have been raised in UP elections, the so-called pink flood, etc., etc., might come back. And you would, then the follow-up would be that interference in the way people live, eat, and so on. So this is a clear threat that exists. The second threat would be to education. Obviously, the education has been under attack. The university spaces have been under attack. We have seen what has happened in uh, first in the universities, uh, Hyderabad Central University, followed by what happened last year in Valar Nehru University, and now in Delhi University. And this has been a pattern in a number of universities. I think those would now be aided by what the central government is going to do in terms of the education ministry, UGC, and so on. It means also wholesale possibilities of change of syllabus, etc. So I think that's the second part of the onslaught we're likely to see. The third is that, that in terms of uh, whatever the public sector has had, the role it has played, all of that can be weakened because now they really are going to hold untrammeled power as it were. So I think these are the immediate threats. There could be other threats as well. But I do see that there is today going to be no checks on the, on the legal uh, power that the government wields, which earlier was provided by the fact that they did not change the laws. Do you have anything to say on, on the Ram Temple? Well, that's an UP issue, but one must remember that the Ram Temple issue was more about the abolition of the Babri Masjid. And that was the real uh, venom that it provided, that we have to destroy what is what they call Apman Kapratik, a sign of our importance, as it were, at that time. So I think the issue was really mobilizing hatred. Rather than the Ram Temple itself, as, you, as we have seen, post demolition of the Babri Masjid, they have never been able to whip up any passion for the Ram Temple. Yes, they may go ahead, build something on the other, but that is not a mobilizing plan. Okay, we have seen that what a sounding defeat BJP faced in Bihar due to the Grand Alliance. If you look at vote share of BSP, SP and Congress together, it's more than 50%. Do you think there are chances of such Grand Alliances in 2019 elections? And if yes, then what are the limits of such alliances? Let's put it this way, the Grand Alliance assumes there is some commonality of politics. If the commonality of politics is not there, it's very difficult to stitch together such an alliance. And also, given the past constituents, the past elect, the, the kind of politics that both SP and the BSP have played, and the kind of constituencies they have, I don't think that's, e that's an easy alliance to forge for instance new. I would say we have to take a state-by-state state, uh, look at what are the possible alliances. I do not see a grand alliance at all India level being built, partly because I believe that opposition to BJP has to be a political opposition. It cannot be an opportunistic alliance of all opposition parties trying to come together, but that doesn't provide a positive political platform. Probably so, uh, knowing the limits of the identity politics, uh, what transformative agenda, what is that transformative agenda that can contain BGP's incredible rise that we have seen? I mean, what's the way ahead for that? Let's put it this way, you know, the, uh, when you talk about the BJP's rise, let's also put it, for a long time, the same platform was contained or defeated. It, it was defeated in the national movement where Hindu nationalism was a platform that the BJP put, the 
RSS had put forward. That was the Hindu nationalist agenda they had put forward. And for a good 60 years after the independence also, they didn't really get traction. The communal politics, which is what the Hindu nationalist agenda is supposed to be, what it is, that started gaining traction only when the Congress vacated what I will call the economic nationalism space, which is the basis of the Indian national movement and also what we saw later as the development of the Nehru, what is called the Nehruvian state, which is really build, building a relatively more autonomous uh, economic space for itself. Of course, for the big bourgeoisie as well. So I think we need to really reflect on what kind of national nationalism BJP is building. And can it be or contested on the basis of a of what what was called neoliberalization or an economic agenda of untrammeled import of foreign capital into India and really trying to integrate integrate the global capital? I think that agenda we have to examine. I would say on one hand we have to look at the economic agenda itself, what it meant, what it means today, and we have to talk about the class agenda that if we want to unite the poor sections of the people who are Muslims, who are Dalits, if we pro you try to unite them on the basis of identities, you get a BSP, you get an SP, you can get different kinds of parties, but you're not going to get something which brings everybody together. If we have to defeat the BJP, we need to get those sections who are really being today uh, increasingly impoverished, who are really being made relatively much more poor, if we want, if we want to get them together, we need a transformative agenda, which arises beyond identities. Identities can help a few people, as we have seen. It helps a certain section, but it doesn't help the communities as a whole. It is not that the Dalits have benefited out of BSP. Some sections have. And I think that kind of transformative politics, neither the SP or the BSP can put forward. And it really depends on how this transformative, transformative agenda today is put, that the Dalits the poor peasantry, the landless labor, the artisans, which is what the Dalit communities and the peasant communities represent. How do you bring them together with the working class politics and how you can transform therefore an India which empowers the people, really gives power to the poor and takes away the power from the rich. And essentially a redistribution of wealth is the transformative agenda we have to put forward before the country. But with the rise of BJP in the country, we'll have to look at the global context also. We have seen rise of right-wing politics across the globe, be it US, Brexit, France, Turkey. Uh, we have seen mix of nationalism, religious identities and corporate nexus which is developing and it's, it's growing very fast among, in different countries. Uh, how do you place it? I mean, why is it happening and what's the way forward to counter it? Again, the analysis of the crisis of what I would say is neoliberalism must be also coupled with the crisis of what I would call liberalism. Neoliberalism grew out of a crisis of the state itself. The state which was seen by both liberal, bourgeois liberal parties, social democracy and the left, the working class parties, the communist parties, as an instrument of redistribution. Neoliberalism started by attacking this concept of state itself. Now, that illegitimization of the state as an instrument of redistribution has proceeded to the extent, even if neoliberalism has run out of steam, which it has right now economically, the delegitimization of the state still continues. So you are seeing, therefore, the rise of uh, a Trump-like phenomena, a billionaire, who is the people are not bothered about the fact that he's a billionaire, but is promising to curb the so-called Washington Beltway. So this is one part of it. The second is you are seeing also the rise of larger uh, forces, which are not now just pure national, German nationalists, French nationalists, uh, English nationalists, or American nationalists, but they're really xenophobic, white nationalism, and therefore anti-Muslim. It is a, it's an interesting issue that you are seeing the rise of imperial powers whose earlier demand was that we shall go and conquer the rest of the world and they must open their doors to us. Now say we need to have barricades preventing Muslims from coming in, immigrants from coming in. By the way, 
uh, a lot of the uh, Modi bhakts love Trump and they think that he's a great guy because he's a white nationalist and therefore an alliance with Hindu nationalists. Well, Bannon's one of his famous uh, books is uh, by a French author who shows how Indians can uh, come into various places, can flood uh, white countries and looks upon Indians as, some, as completely dirty. In fact, he calls them dirty, the author, the French author who's, who Bannon is in love with. And as you know, he's a chief, one of the chief ideologues of uh, the Trump administration. So we are into that kind of situation where the white nationalism is in fact supranational in terms of European and American identities. And it's really against the rest of the globe. So we, but we are also seeing the crisis of what I would call humanist values, of liberal values, which is what the bourgeoisie represented at, at one point of time. In its fall, which it is at the moment, what you see is really the worst kind of things coming out. And here is the resonance that here is, while they seem to have no love for the brown races, and they consider Indians to be, as I said, third eating and so on, dirty, etc all the, the negative epithets you can think of, some of our people would like to identify with them. That's a dichotomy you have. But it is the larger issue really of attack on the state. Untrammeled capitalism, untrammeled greed being enshrined at the core of these political forces. And I think that's the issue. Built on hatred and greed as the element. So I think this is not a stable long-term phenomenon. And we have to see how we can bring the resistance to it. Thanks for giving us this time.